Amen this morning. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be in the Lord this morning. And I just uh, thank you, Father, for the mighty work that you continue to do in all of our lives. And uh, we are just coming this morning in the precious name of Jesus, just excited uh, to be on the call this morning, to be on the live Zoom, because we are operating in the spirit of God. And so uh, we will this morning be uh, reading from the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter of Galatians. And um, what we want to learn today is how to destroy uh, the phantom yokes, destroy the yokes that are placed in front of us that are put in our lives and, and to uh, pull us down or to make us think that we're somewhere that we're not. And so um, we want to establish what this yoke is, what, what these yokes are, because every one of us allow them in our lives at a time or two, and uh, we don't uh, trust on how to break those yokes. And so this morning, we want to learn how to destroy the phantom yokes. And so last week, we studied on being a false Christian, a false prophet, a uh, false prophet of God. And um, and so I want to make sure you understand what a prophet is. A prophet is a person inspired by God uh, to reveal God's purpose and God's will. And so in the Old Testament, the prophets were individuals God chose to relay his will. They were individuals that God chose to relay his will. And so the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Old Testament, uh, the, the Holy Spirit wasn't dwelling in everybody's heart uh, who believed. Uh, it was only after Jesus that Jesus sent back the, the Holy Spirit, sent back that spirit to reside in all the hearts of those who believe. That's why we're able to get on a call consistently trusting in God and not trusting in a man. That's why we are always uh, uh, filled with uh, the spirit as we trust in God. That's why we are always encouraged to trust in Jesus who died on the cross 2,000 years ago, but lives uh, to, to, you know, lives eternally to be with the Father. And so th that's why we're excited about that. That's why we stay in that because of what the Holy Spirit continues to do. It continues to encourage us. It continues to take us in the right direction. So in the uh, in the New Testament, God's will is laid out in the scripture through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God's will was laid out through the prophets. It was watered down. You couldn't understand it totally because Jesus had not came to completely um, help us to understand it. And so in the New Testament, the will of God is laid out in the word of God. And so uh, it, those inspired to reveal God's will through the scripture, by definition, are prophets of God. You're not, you don't need anything new because it's already in the scripture. You don't, there's no new revelation. It's already in the scripture. It's already defined in God's scripture. So as we revealed last week, a false prophet reveals God's word as, uh, and, you know, falsely reveals God's word. And as Jesus said, as Jesus said to us, he said to, that you can tell them by their fruit. And that hit my home, that hit everybody's home who was on the call, it hit everybody's household because Jesus wasn't talking about the people outside the church, he was talking about the people who were inside the church, not the people who tried to break in and, and, uh, and cause problem and havoc in the church, but the people who were already in the church who could be falsely teaching the word of God. And so us as Christians, we all teach the word of God. We all tell others about Jesus. And so anyone um, who teaches uh, the word or claim to be Christians, like the woman of God spoke earlier, which is technically all of us, as a professed believer, what you produce identifies who you truly are. So that was a uh, revelation to me, uh, and that should be revelation to you also. What you produce uh, shows who you truly are. And I'm not talking about how many people come to Christ. I'm talking about what comes out of you. So, you know, Jesus says that bad fruits can't come from a good tree. 
and good fruits can't come from a bad tree. So as a child of God, you shouldn't be producing the enemy's fruit. That's what we understand by this. And so, like we said, to, to curse is not of God. To harbor anger is not of God. To hate sinfully is not of God. To murder is not of God. We, we always, we've read up on or watched a series, the thing on Jim Jones, who, who was followed by, uh, who was a false prophet who was followed by thousands and thousands of people, which led to their death, uh, you know, in the end. But his fruits, if you were looking at what the scripture says, his fruits were multiple relationships, drug use, and profanity. And so if you looked at his fruits as a believer, you go in there and see his fruits and say, mm -mm, there's no way I'm going to follow this man. And so if they had looked at his fruits according to what the word says and compared it to God's word, they would have ran away from him, but they did. And so to follow anyone who holds on to any of those bad fruits is dangerous. If you see, you know, if I say one thing but do another, it's dangerous to follow me. Any man of God who says one thing and does another, it's dangerous to follow me follow that person. If I'm saying that, that, you know, that I'm constantly in love with God, but when you're out with me, I'm cursing just like everybody else or saying bad things or doing things like everybody else, that makes me dangerous. And for uh, you as a believer to hold on to any of those fruits are dangerous. It's dangerous. A person of the nature uh, is of that nature is still operating in the world. And so if you're still operating in the world, then you're producing bad fruits and you're not walking as a Christian. You have to switch from one to the other. You have to give it all to God, turn and hand it all to God, even your mouths, even the way you act, the way you respond, because those things are not of God. And so the one thing I want you to understand is that um, a person who's not operating as a Christian, they are restrained by the old yoke, the old yoke that if you are a Christian, you should have been freed from them because the old yoke represents the old, who you used to be. The new yoke is you become the, in the yoke of Jesus Christ. And he says his yoke is easy. So write this down. A yoke biblically represents slavery or submission to something else. A yoke represents a, you know, a biblically, uh, you know, slavery or submission to something else. And so to break a yoke uh, means to be released from what you were previously controlled by, who you used to be doesn't matter to who you become because you go from being an old uh, of the old world to a new creation. And so a farmer places a yoke around uh, its oxen uh, to have the oxen perform what the, uh, the farmer wants it to perform, wants them to perform. And so without the yoke, uh, the control is gone. And so they can't, the farmer can't control the, the oxen and have them go in the direction and pull what they want to pull and do what they, uh, what, what the farmer wants it to do uh, without the yoke around the oxen's neck. And so when God freed Israel from Egypt, that was considered a breaking of the yoke of bondage that Egypt had over Israel. And so today, today we are reading from the scripture, and we want to see what the scripture says about those who believe in the Lord and follow him. Because what we have to do is we have to learn how to destroy those yokes that have been hindering us as Christian believers. It's time we get away from, uh, you know, all that deception and all those practices and walk in freedom that was prepared for us through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty. So here we go. And, and uh, you know, our walk, 
as a new creation. Our walk is a new child of God. Uh, it's supposed to be good. It's supposed to, uh, to, to follow the good fruits of God. And if it's not, that's where a Jim Jones or a David Koresh who had children uh, you know, as his wives, as early as the age of 11, that's where folks like that sneak in and guide people in the wrong direction. There is freedom that we should take on as believers. It's away from sin, not towards it. It's away from sin. And so if we don't know what we are doing is sin, we don't stray to, uh, away from it. We stay in it. And so what we have to do as Christians, we have to learn what godly production in our lives is. And any deceivers, you know, we have to understand that any deceivers will be exposed the moment they speak. And so if you are a believer in Christ, when a person like David Koresh or Jim Jones try to pull you in the wrong direction because you are sound in the word of God, you do not get pulled because the one in you is stronger than the one who's against you. You know that God wants you to work. God wants you to learn. God wants you to understand. And you're not going to, un I mean, and you begin to see and expose the enemy as he comes in. And you have no fear, but God himself. And so I want you to remember this. The Galatians came from old non-productive, I mean, the old, the old non-productive uh, ways, and they were trying to uh, reach God by their works. And so uh, they were always taught that their works will, will, will get them closer to God, which is only false stability. It's not true. The only way you get to God is through faith. The only way you got to God then was through faith. And the only way you get to God now and forever is through faith. And those of you who think different, it's wrong. You're going in the wrong direction. And so faith is the only thing that brings you closer to God and helps you to understand. And that faith is in Jesus Christ. So we know we don't reach God by works. We know we reach him by faith. We know we reach him by walking in the freedom that was supplied through Jesus Christ. And so what we need to know is why does the yoke of bondage continue to come in our lives? So let's read this morning what the Apostle Paul explains about freedom that believers in Galatia should live by and believers in San Antonio and every other country that trust in Jesus should live by. Thank you, Father, for your word this morning. We're in Galatians 5, starting at verse 13. Verse 13 uh, through verse 14 says this. And this is Galatians 5, 13 uh, verse through 14. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And so think about these Galatians then. They were consumed by trying to live, uh, uh, live or get to God by, by fulfilling all of the laws. They were doing all the, the religious acts and the religious laws. And Paul is saying, who was a, a Pharisee at one time, Paul is saying that they don't fulfill uh, the entire, the law by following, I mean, following all those requirements, Paul is saying that we, they, refill, fulfill the entire law by just loving your neighbor as yourself. How does that work? Well, let, let's continue on because I, I want you to get how that works. This is what he says in 15 through 18. He says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out and you will, uh, or you will be destroyed by each other. And so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you were led by the spirit, you were not under the law. Wow, this is so deep because uh, sometimes we wonder, we say, man, when am I gonna get over this? When am I gonna get this out of my life? When am I gonna uh, stop being tempted and stop being you know, you know, uh, drawn by, by those things of the flesh? Well, you're, it, the only way you get away from that is to die. Because the scripture says clearly, 
the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit which is contrary to the flesh, but they are constant, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. What does that mean? It means that this, this battle goes on forever and ever. This battle continues on as long as you are in this body, as long as you are on this earth. And so now the, the exciting thing that you understand, that we understand as Christian believers is when you become a when you become a believer, when you believe in Christ, the moment you believe, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within your heart. It doesn't come later. It comes as you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. So the Holy Spirit comes to dwell with you uh, within your heart. And, and it gives assurance to your salvation. It makes you feel comfortable to know that you are in Christ, to know that you have been saved, to know that's just the one thing that gets you up and say, gets you excited to know that God has saved you. And it enables us to live in Christ and to glorify him and him alone. You didn't have access to three things when, when this happened. And these are the three things I want you to know. You have access to what God the Father planned for you. That's one of those things. You have access to what God the Son purchased for you on the cross. That's the second part. And third, you have what God the Spirit personalizes for you and applies to your life as you yield to the three. Wow. This is going to be good. You know, so I ask that you please listen as the Spirit of God reveals this to us today. Because some of us have been consumed by things that and don't know how to break them. But you can't break them by yourself. You can only break them with the strength of God. And so the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit set every true Christian free. And I want you to write that down. If you learn anything from what we are studying this morning, you have to know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has set every Christian free. Every true follower of Jesus Christ, you have been set free. From what is the question? And the answer is everything that was a yoke around your life. Every yoke that you can think of has been broken in Christ Jesus. I know it's hard to believe, but it is the truth. Every yoke that has, has hindered you, whether it be alcohol addiction, drug addiction, sexual addiction, whether it had been wrong attractions, you have been broken through it by the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you should be free from guilt. The guilt of, that comes of sin because of the Father's forgiveness. Once you were forgiven by God, you repent to him and he always is faithful to forgive you. So if you're free from the guilt of sin because of the Father's forgiveness, then what about the penalty? Well, the penalty, the penalty of sin was paid by Jesus. So the Father did one, the Son paid the penalty, meaning what? The sins you created, uh, that, that you have uh, committed in the old life, the sins that you've done wrong, you've been forgiven of. And the sins that you do wrong now, the things you've said wrong, the sister in Christ said that she used to have road rage and, and that was as a Christian. And so by her repenting and giving it to God, those things have been forgiven and the penalty of sin has been paid through Jesus. So if a person receives a life sentence for a crime, a crime they committed, the sentence is only fulfilled through death. That means if that person dies, they've completed their life sentence. And so that's important to understand because Jesus became your sins, the things you said, the road rage, the anger, the frustration. He became your sins. And when he died, with him, he took your penalty for those sins. He took them away with his death. Does that mean you won't make another mistake? No, but it means that when you do, you can operate in the forgiveness of God by asking him to forgive you truthfully in your heart and turning and walking in the other direction. So, so two things here. If the father's forgiveness has freed you from the guilt and the son's death freed you from the penalty, 
What's the question? People say, okay, pastor, uh, that's all great. But why does the power of sin still seem so overbearing? And why does it seem so overwhelming in a believer's life? Look, it happens to me. It happens to every one of us. Now, why does it seem so overpowering and overbearing in the person's life? And that's what we want to answer today. That would be because the believer hasn't tapped into the third. Remember, we said the father's forgiveness frees you. You shouldn't have the guilt. And the son's death frees you from the penalty. But it's the third thing that we need to tap in to make us complete. The third part of who God is, is the Holy Spirit. It is the father, son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, not just the Father, not just the Father and the Son, but the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are three in one. And so the Father's forgiveness freed us from the guilt. You shouldn't walk in guilt of your mistakes because, of, because God forgives you. You should walk in asking God to forgive you. You should walk in, in trusting in God and walk, you, you should focus more on the forgiveness versus the guilt. The son's death freed you from the penalty. So you should be worried more about, uh, you shouldn't uh, be worried uh, about the punishment that Jesus saved you from because he's always saved you from the punishment the moment he died on the cross. Your sin died because of you believing in him. Here's the important part. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that the power of sin is broken. Remember that. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that the power of sin is broken. You could not break the power of guilt. It was only broken through God, the Father. You could not break the power of the penalty. It was already broken only through Jesus. When he died, when he said it is finished, that means it is completed. That means your sins have been completed through him. So the last thing to understand is you cannot break the power of sin on your own. It's unless the Holy Spirit of God is permitted to saturate our hearts as believers with the love of God. You can't learn how to love like God unless you have God reveal it to you through his spirit. Then everything will walk in precious love that is of God. If you uh, do not allow the Holy Spirit, which is the third part of it, to saturate your heart as a believer with love, everything left will reign. You, you can have the, 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 you can have the power of guilt broken over your life. Or you can have the power of the penalty broken over your life. But if you don't allow the third part, which is the Holy Spirit, which is equally God to saturate your heart with love, then everything that is left, which is your old self, will reign over your lives. Through the spirit of God, there is no fight because the power is already broken. The power of sin is destroyed. But through the flesh, you are still in a battle that you cannot win. So if you say, why do I continue to lie? It's because you are operating in your flesh and you can't win that battle. But when you operate in Christ, you know that you are redeemed. You know that the penalty has been paid. You have no guilt and you don't operate in lying anymore because you're no longer subject to the penalties anymore. Verse 19 through 21 says this, says the acts of flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, uh, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God on earth is God's presence residing in you and changing you to direct towards him and not towards the world. And we're not talking about eternal kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom of God on this earth. 
is you can tap into that right now by allowing the spirit to work in your lives. And so here is the work that we have to do as Christians. Here is the work that we have to do as Christians so that these things do not fail because the God can do all things but fail. You can fail at a job. You can fail at a relationship. You can fail at all kinds of things in your life. But in Christ Jesus, if you operate in the spirit of God, you can do all things but fail because you're operating in Christ. That's the exciting thing about this. The Holy Spirit works off the planting of, of seeds. Not just the planting of any seed, but the planting of our seeds. The Holy Spirit only fails to work when we fail to plant. That's it. As long as you plant the seeds of God, the good seeds, the Holy Spirit will continue to, 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 to manifest that harvest in your life. The Holy Spirit works off the planting of our seeds, and the only failure is when we don't plant seeds. You can take that. That should be it. Sometimes we expect a harvest as believers of a seed we didn't plant. And then we blame God as the reason we didn't receive what we didn't plant. So this is crazy because as Christians, we are supposed to work. God wants us to work. When God, when God created Adam, Adam's job was to name the animals. He was constantly at work doing the work of God. And so sometimes we expect the harvest of a seed we never, never planted, and then we blame God for this. If you are a Christian, and you operate in jealousy, if you are a Christian and you operate in envy, or you operate in anger, or you operate in selfish ambition, it's because you've planted less seeds into the things that are of God. You planted less seeds into the word of God. You planted less seeds in prayer, less seeds in worship, and less seeds in fellowship with Christian believers. That's all it amounts to. And so where you're at right now, if you're looking and saying, I have this problem with this, it's because you haven't planted the right seeds into God. Because when you plant them into God, he can do all things but fail. And so it's not that God is failing, it's that you are failing to plant the seeds. All you've got to do is let go of the seeds of God. Plant them into your life. What is that? The word of God? What is that? Prayer? What is that? Worship and fellowship with other believers. If you plant those seeds, you are guaranteed to reap a harvest. And so Christians say, well, I don't know how to get straight. Well, you don't need to be sitting on a couch with a therapist. Show me a Christian who is consumed with the flesh, and I'll show you a Christian who lacks in those areas. You fail to plant seeds. If the, the more you read the word of God and allow it to be applied to your life, the less you operate in your flesh. It is that simple. It is not complex. It is the word of God. So God gives us the freedom as a gift. And at times we sow seeds of bondage, which is a curse. We attach ourselves to the things of the world, which is a curse. It is impossible to plant seeds of the word of God. It is impossible to plant seeds of prayer, seeds of worship, seeds of fellowship, and, and, and with other believers, and not reap God's promises, his promised gifts. So God promises us freedom and abundance in our harvest, but if you plant no seeds, why are you expecting a harvest? We have got to change as believers and plant the seeds into God. You expect to be financially blessed, but you don't financially support your God. God doesn't need it. He just asks for it because it's your thing you put your focus on, like the rich young ruler. He asks for it because it's where our hearts are sometimes. So let's read. I want to read uh, because you have to understand as you plant seeds into the word of God, prayer, worship, fellowship, as believers, you will reap the harvest of the spirit. Let's read verse 22 through 25. It says, but the fruit of the spirit 
is love, is joy, is peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is what God gives you. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Wow. So you can get all that through planting those seeds. Of course you can. So, so, so believers should, we as believers, if we're walking correctly, doesn't matter what happens in this world, we should walk in complete freedom. The Father freed you from the guilt. The Son's death freed you from the penalty. And the third thing, the Holy Spirit frees you from the power that sin claims to have. So then what is the problem? Why do we constantly get consumed by the things of the flesh? Why do we constantly get tempted by the things of the flesh? Why do we continue to walk in those broken yokes, even though they've been destroyed from our lives? Why do we continue to be tempted to lie? Why do we be continue to be uh, tempted to steal? Why do we walk in the wrong direction and say wrong things? Turn left when God says turn right, not have faith. Give when he says give, but we don't give. We, we go in the wrong direction. We keep. Why do we walk in broken yokes? And I think uh, that's the answer we want to give you this morning. If you were convicted of a crime and spent a year in jail, and then were acquitted of that crime, would you wake up every day and operate as if you were still confined, or would you rejoice and enjoy the freedom that you have been given? The problem is, if we, if we are not attached to uh, the fruits, I mean, the question we have to ask is, if we are not attached to the fruits of lying or cursing or anger, then why do we still give in to them at times? Why do we still attach ourselves to things that we, that the yoke has been broken from us? And I want to give you this example, you know, an elephant, elephants are known to uh, be, to have great memories. And uh, because of their memories, when baby elephants are, as a part of their training, they are chained to a stake in the ground. There's a stake in the ground and it's solidly put, put in the ground and that baby elephant struggles to break the, the chain, but due to their small size, they are unable to break free. And so eventually the elephant gives up trying and it remembers that. And so as the elephant grows larger and larger, they have the ability to free themselves from the same stake, but they are held back because of their past belief and they never attempt to break free. And so as soon as they see that stake in the ground, they just submit to the stake. The truth be told, that yoke which was able to hold them no longer has the power to restrain them, but they don't know it. What God is trying to tell us today is that that which had power over us was broken the moment we accepted Jesus. What I'm telling you is you're living off the, the, the phantom yokes. They are not there. They are not, they don't exist, but you have that stake in the ground that you think you can't get over, but it's already been broken in the name of Jesus. All you've got to do is pull towards the Lord like that elephant should have pulled a little bit when that stake was in him. But because he didn't have faith, he didn't pull. And so what I'm saying today is whatever yoke you think you have has been broken the moment Jesus died on the cross. If God came down in the flesh, was nailed to a cross as an unblemished sacrifice for your sins, his death conquered your sin and his resurrection is proof of your acceptance before the father. <laughs> let me, let me, let me say this again. God came down in the flesh, was nailed to the cross to, to be crucified. He was an unblemished sacrifice for your sins. All of your sins died with him. 
His death conquered your sin and his resurrection is proof of your acceptance by the Father. You have to freely turn towards God and repent and know that in him, the yokes have been broken and can no longer hold on to you. It just is false. It's not real. They have already been destroyed. The bondage you see is of the past. It's in the world. If you turn towards God, you will see that that addiction no longer has no attraction or no longer has no strength over your life. You know that the burden has been destroyed through Jesus Christ. The burden was based on what others thought about you, but now you live for the one of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means you've been freed from lying. You, you've been freed from lying. You thought you had to lie. You thought that you, you are uh, attracted to lying, but in Christ Jesus, you have been freed from lying. Why is that? Because you are only operating with an audience of one who sees all that you do. And so you make a mistake and you tell a lie. You say, God, forgive me. And you walk in the right direction. You make a mistake and you tell another. You say, God, forgive me. And you walk in the next direction. You continue to tell lies. You continue to trust God. And what happens is he breaks that yoke because it was no longer yours. You have been freed. From generational curses. You thought you were going to be an alcoholic like maybe your father was, or maybe your father's father was, or maybe your father's father father was. It's part of the family. Well, no, you have been made a new creation. That's a phantom yoke. You have It has been destroyed through the blood of Jesus Christ, which means that even though your father may have drank, you don't have to drink because it's been broken in the name of Jesus. You are free from the addiction of smoking. You think I have to smoke because when I get anxious, I have to smoke or because my father smoked or because his father smoked or because it's part of the family. I'm telling you today that in Christ Jesus, that yoke has been broken because it no longer exists. It is a phantom yoke. How do I get over it, Pastor? You can't do it on your own. You can only do it in Christ. In Christ, he takes away those addictions. In Christ, he takes away those feelings. And you say, man, well, what, am I, what do I do when my body gets anxious? Well, you follow in the word of God. You pray to God. You ask him to forgive you. You ask him to destroy that yoke that you see that is no longer true. You are freed from the addiction of drugs. Now, does it physically uh, consume, can it physically consume your body? Yes, but in Christ, you are a new creation. As you take on the word of God, as you trust and believe in Christ, as you pray more, as you give all honor and glory to him, as you seek the scripture for things that breaks addictions over our lives, you realize that the addiction was broken the moment Jesus died on the cross. You are free from the addiction that comes through pornography. But the temptation is there, not in Christ. In Christ, he destroys all those temptations. In the flesh, the temptation comes. So you begin to realize that those yokes were broken the moment you believed in Christ. So how do you fix it? You have to learn how to operate in the spirit of God. And the spirit of God brings all those things, joy, peace, happiness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But the, 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 the flesh brings all those other things, anxiousness, bitterness, wrath, anger, frustration. And so if you take on any of those things, if you have any of those things in your heart, that means that you are not taking on the full action of the Holy Spirit. That is a gift to you. It is it's free. If a person gives you a gift and said, this is a gift, I want you to open it 
and you just sit it down in the, in your living room and let it sit there. And inside that gift is a million dollars, but you said, no, I don't believe it's mine. I'm not going to take it. I don't feel I should take it, but it's in your, in, in a million dollars, it's a million dollars and you lose your job and you still refuse to open a gift, but it's there and it's yours and it has your name on it. And, and then you, you lose your house and you're sitting there saying, man, but I still have this box. I'll keep this box. And you never open up the gift. It does nothing for you. But if you open it up, you realize how precious it is. You realize that it had your name on it, that it was for you since the beginning of time, that God has engulfed you with his presence. He has those things for you. He promises you those gifts. All you have to do is pull away from the things that are of this world. And when you do that, you contain the spirit of God. You no longer need to fear about a Jim Jones because you know that the word of God is in you and it will deter any of those things that are not of, of God. You know that you, you're not afraid of a, a David Koresh or any of those false teachers because you know that the word of God is in you because you choose to get yourself straight. You're not worried about your children because you continue to uh, plant them into the word of God and have them listen to it and understand it and follow it. Uh, because when they, you know, like the scripture says, when you train up a child in the way they should go, when they're on their own, they'll remember what you have done. They will not depart from it. So when you operate in the promised gifts of God, you learn how to destroy the yokes that are of the enemy. They're phantom yokes. They're not real. They don't exist. They only exist in your flesh, but you are not, you are in this world, but not of this world. You have become a new creation. You are the old has passed away and all has become new. What you have to do is take your flesh and submit it to the word of God, submit it to praying, submit it to worship, submit it to singing and praising in God, submit it to giving all honor and glory to God, submit it to listening to the word of God, submit it to reading the word of God, submit it to trusting the word of God, submitted to everything that is in Christ. And what happens is it pushes out all of those phantom yokes. It destroys them. And then what it brings in is the Holy Spirit of God, which brings in the Father and the Son, which brings in freedom, freedom to know that you have been forgiven of every sin you have committed, knowingly and unknowingly as you repent to God. Freedom to know that Jesus Christ has paid the price for all that you have done and all that you can do. So because of that, you walk in the glory of God. People say, well, why don't, you know, well, that means that I can freely go and sin. No, as a new creation, because you love God, you don't want to do it anymore. The curse word coming out of your mouth feels so condemning because you know that which is in you is greater than what's against you. So you begin to operate in the Holy Spirit of God. And that Holy Spirit of God brings on love. That Holy Spirit of God brings on joy. Just like the woman of God said earlier, she gets broken from the road rage because of her prayer to God and trust in God. And all of a sudden, those things that used to hinder her or move her change to the love and the joy and the peace of God. That Holy Spirit brings on forbearance. That Holy Spirit brings on kindness. That Holy Spirit brings on goodness. See, where people used to make you mad, it now operates in kindness. Where people used to, uh, you know, get you to go in the wrong direction, you no longer do it. And I know some of you have experienced that at Walmart or HEB when somebody tries to talk to you in the wrong direction, and then you go and snap and get buck and get mad. Well, now you operate in love. You operate in joy. You operate in peace. You operate in patience. You operate in goodness because what you display is who you are. Scripture says gentleness, self-control. As you become a Christian, you learn to listen to your brothers and sisters. You learn to hear them clearly. And it says against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So family, I'm simply saying that in Christ Jesus, 
all of those phantom yokes that have been over your life, whatever it is, wherever you are, whether it be with your finances, whether it be with your anger, whether it be with your lust, lusting, whether it be with your, um, your, your fear, whatever it is, those are phantom yokes in Christ Jesus. It says, I give you not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So if I have a sound mind, why do I operate in fear? Because of the phantom yokes. They're not even there no more. You are the elephant and you have the stake and you can just pull it up and say, no more will I walk in fear. No more will I walk in anger. No more will I walk in bitterness. No more will I walk in lack of faith. I will trust in the Lord God Almighty and give all honor and glory to him and him alone in the name of Jesus. I'm asking that you hear clearly what God is saying this morning. You no longer have to take on the lying. You no longer have to take on the bitterness. You no longer have to take on the cursing. You don't need those anymore. They don't exist in the new life you have become. So if you start with the first lie, if you start with the first curse word and don't be complacent and accept it, then the phantom yokes will be destroyed from your life. And Satan hates this conversation because he knows that if you, the, the, the believers, start listening to what God is saying through us, you'll realize that it's no longer there, even though you thought it was. Let's repent together, family. Let's repent and let's ask God into our hearts every day, every second of the day. Let's repent and pray together. I want you to say this. If this is your first time and you are starting to believe in Christ, that he died for your sins, and you know that, that, that if you go to heaven, I mean, if you die, you want to go to heaven. You want to be with God eternally. If you believe that, know that that fact that you believe that was a gift of God. He was the one who shared that with you. It's not me. He used me as the vessel. And so I want you to repeat after me. Let's all say that together. I want you to say, let's all say, say, Lord, Lord, I am a sinner that you died for. Forgive me, cleanse me, and help me to follow you. I believe in you and I trust in you. In Jesus' name. If you've done that, I want you to give God honor and glory in the house of the Lord, knowing that he has protected you and he has restored you from all.